Oh. Yeah, I just decided to go right into it. Cool. But your your brain's really tired. A bit, yeah. Yeah. An intense day. Because I spent so long on those things, on yeah. the stupid tapes from yeah. audition tapes for today. But also, I like was like, oh, I need to file for unemployment. I need to finish my taxes. So like those kind of things also sort of happened. Yeah. And I got super confused by unemployment. Because oh, like, who is my employer? I know. So I like went through like this big of a stack of, I don't know how it is for you guys, every but like job. every check, right. which is like 250 <gasps> things. And they each come with a, a cover from SAG yeah. that's got like some information that looks important that I always keep. And then behind that, there's a, there's like a, a stub from a company that's like entertainment partners. That's what I would think. And then at the bottom of that is the physical check. Yeah. So I like ripped the check off. I deposited or whatever. And then I've ended up keeping them because now I'm doing it electronically. So I now have the stack of checks as well. But I also have the two pages from each check. So it's like a thousand pieces of paper. And I can't tell what's important. Um, this is a really basic... I imagine a lot of people are in the same situation. Yeah, so apparently there's a SAG after a yeah, webinar exactly. tomorrow. Oh, there is? At 10 a.m. Oh my god, maybe I, need, I think I need to do that tomorrow. About unemployment. Yeah, yeah, because I, I would just think they should be providing some information about yes. how to do that. Because it's confusing. Yeah, and I'm sure like it's not just actors. Like There's a lot of freelance like gig-type workers that are in the same boat. Yeah. Yeah, but I think even for them, like, Uber is their employer. Mm -hmm. Well, like, it's the only entity that is present. Well, that's why I was like, gig, I don't know if this would apply, but it's like, let's say you're a wedding photographer. So, oh my God. no more weddings for you. Presumably, you get to apply for unemployment, mm -hmm. right? But then, that's why I was like, oh, is it that? I would think it's that kind of situation where what? You have to compile every single person who's ever hired you? Not ever, but 18 months. Yeah. A year and a half, which I'm now realizing goes back to like November 2018. And if only I had only worked in California, but I didn't. So I had to fill out this like 11 page whole application that I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have had to fill out if I had only worked in California. Really? Mm -hmm. Wait, but are we talking about, because it just says. It's New York, yeah. Yeah. But it only takes, well, like, I don't care how much it is. I don't care how much it is. It happened. Yeah. Yeah, so I uh, filled out this part as much as I could of the 11 pages, but most of the things that I'm confused about are like employer. And now I'm wondering if Entertainment Partners is not a separate entity, but is like SAG's bank? I don't know, that's a good question. What is Entertainment Partners? But that's like who I get all my everything from. Yeah, I know what you mean, all your residuals. Yeah. So like when I fill out my taxes, I get my, what is it, like my T1 or whatever. They'll be like, yeah, you earn this much from entertainment partners. Do you have that? I get W2s from entertainment yeah, partners. Yeah, yeah. Which, yes. would, which to me would say then that you could just be like, yes, they're my employer. I know. I just don't know. Like, I could. I feel like I could legitimately put any old yeah. shit on the thing, but there's probably a way to. Because the other thing is that, like, I'll show you the bottom of the entertainment partners thing is like unemployment information, and then it has some weird code which the form's not asking me for. 
the form is asking me for like address, phone number, dates worked, like what I made, name of the company. It's not asking for a code, which in New York, I remember the one other time I've done, I've been through this, there's a code that each company has that's like, this is their unemployment number or something. But the good news is that there's a webinar at 10 o'clock. I just get my butt on the computer. Just don't sleep until one. Just don't sleep till one. Okay. And hopefully it will be reviewed. Yeah. I think that's that's amazing. That's almost. It's funny that it's tomorrow morning. I know. Yeah. Is this for uh, reimbursement in the States? Yes. Unemployment insurance is what in the, the States. It's called, yeah. Yeah, and then somewhere in there it come time to make us spend the whole day too. What a good day. <laughs> so good. It was such a good day. It's okay. It makes me feel a bit less crazy, but you have those days too. What days? When you're like, uh, can we retape? I'm like, yes, we can. Because I've been on the other side of that. When I suddenly watch them back, I'm like, this makes no sense. Yeah. What did I just spend two hours doing? I know. The frustrating thing is that, like, it wasn't real quick. Like, we didn't do the, it wasn't like a whirlwind and we got done with the first session and then I was like, let's go back. It was like a long time. We did reshoots. That's what we did. Yeah. But I'm pretty glad because I was not concerned about all of the things that I was concerned about in mm. the later one. Okay. And I with confidence deleted all the preceding ones because sometimes in the yeah. in the feet crazy you're like gotta keep the first session in case the whole second session That's was true. worthless. So you burnt the bread. Yeah, I was like this, this definitely I would do something else. Yes. I also was like there's a reason we deleted the <laughs> <laughs> so fucking lose my shit. Uh, yeah, I thought you did some fine work today. Oh, thank you. Yes. Was it when we were accidentally rolling? That you said <laughs> uh, I think it would have been fun to do like a B sides to. I know. If I wasn't so nutty. But you had to send it off and all of that. And also, I think that would take me legitimately so much longer because <laughs> you can't walk. <gasps> right. And I don't really know how I'm going to. I like this idea of making every every acting choice an evil choice. I think that's really funny. Especially when you're not really evil. Yeah. There you go. Especially when it's like innocuous characters like this one. <laughs> like where it's like, no, she's not evil, but you're like, but. I know. She's like objective in the moral spine of the. <laughs> yes, but what if? There's always like a twist. <laughs> like <laughs> I made the choice, but secretly yeah. she killed or the parents. He's a toy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that doesn't make sense, but um, <laughs> yeah, she's AI. Yeah, I feel the need to perform a, I mean, to, to do a lot of roles as if they're AI. Like Pierre. Mm, that's the secret. There's a robot. That's the secret. <laughs> you know how, you know, the, you know, the secret. <laughs> that's it. It's that. Yeah. You guys don't need to watch the documentary now. We told you. How is there a documentary about the secret anyway? It's fucking um, stupid. Have you ever seen it? I think I probably have. I don't know how you avoid seeing it. It's like people being like, secret. That's not a documentary. It's There's nothing to document. It's such a weird documentary. Because there's there's no there's you're there's not they're not a documentary. You're right. They're just it's just a bunch of interviews yeah. with these people Talking that you've them. never heard of really before unless you're already in the world, in that world. In the world of the secret? Pretty much. In a secret world. <laughs> and they're just like, yeah, the secret's real. Yeah, end of documentary. <laughs> it's interviews, and that's <laughs> it. 
I don't think you get to call that a documentary. <laughs> I don't know. Then Oprah is a documentarian. Mm, yeah, she is. Like, and we watch morning documentaries instead of morning, <laughs> whatever they call talk shows. Oh, yeah. Morning shows. Talk shows. Mo talk shows? I think you can throw talk in there, or you can just have a morning show. Late like night. the morning show. Which I haven't watched. The morning show. I auditioned for that. I know. Who went better? Better than. I didn't even get to that part. Because I stopped before we got to the part that was supposed to be you. Was it? Did you? I don't remember what it was. I don't know if it was in the first episode. I don't remember. I can remember if it was one of those ones that I was like, I don't know what happened. And then like looked on the. I have no memory of it, but I probably did. Anyway, is this our short, short preamble? Yeah. Which I think is pretty short so far. Yeah. As long as we keep going for Record long. shortness. Yeah, because we're going to start it so late today. I know. It's because things are going on. What are you doing, East Coast Acorn? East Coast Acorn? I, what do you mean? Or east, or the acorn of the East Coast. Yeah. What's it so late? Eleven o'clock. Oh. It's the highlight of his day. I guess it's not. Open. It's not that late. It's late-ish. Ish. Ish. I find it strange that my dad stays up till like one thirty. You do. Morning. Yeah. What does he do? I thought. I thought you're supposed to go to bed. Early as you get older. No. No. My mom goes to bed real late. Yeah. Mm. But he stays up past me. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Whew, living it up. Yeah. In point clear. Mount way out. In point clear. Yeah. That sounds like a night <laughs> spot. Point Claire. That would be a good name for a club. Point Claire. Claire. Janessa thinks that everyone in every script is named Claire. Mm. An astonishing, I would actually love to do the data on this. I think there's an astonishing number of scripts written with the name Claire. You know, this isn't the first Tess that I've read for. Interesting. Tess is a very, like, best friend. Okay. And I've never met a Tess. It's a very best friend. You wouldn't name the main character Tess. No, no, no. No, no, no. <laughs> what I, happened? You what? Just for that. I Let's expect, name all the main characters Tess. I expect this Tess of the Dobervilles. Right? Is That's it. That's the only one. <laughs> So we're on book freaking seven. Yes, we are. Woo! Are we doing bird calls or? Woo! Woo! No, that was a celebratory ejaculation. Ugh. What ugh? Just the vocabulary in this book needs to be used. We haven't even commented on the fact they're like, the Rostovs were a little unsure of intercourse with Andrew. <laughs> yeah. They use intercourse a lot, and we have never made a juvenile joke That's about true. it. That's true. How did we get by that? I don't know. We're, maybe we're growing up. It's maturity. Yeah. I, I feel like I've really matured during this process. Don't you? Mostly during, mostly between books, for instance. <laughs> I had a spurt. Yeah, yeah, you did have a spurt. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been great. Um, book uh, six, book six, book yeah, six. Yeah, what happened? Uh, Andrew, so like, many proposals in this book. I know. Yeah. 
I propose that there be fewer proposals. I propose that there be more. Oh, <laughs> like per chapter. Okay, book seven it might happen. Yeah, I want the older. I I think like that's gonna happen. I think. Oh yeah. Yeah. The older Jen. The Rostov. The old. Not Rostov. What the fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the Mademoiselle Bourienne. Yes. Yeah, I think Andrew's father has the hots for Mademoiselle Bourienne. I'm like, it's hard to tell whether it's out of spite. <laughs> he's like fine i'll get married too you you are very attractive <laughs> Yikes. That, that's gonna be a happy a happy wedding happy marriage well she's a happy person yeah does she oh, marry Ugh. can you imagine after all this being like great now we're in the phase where my dad threatens to marry her also, what happened to Mary trying to contrive a relationship? I know between... she didn't really take that seriously. <laughs> she did she? Very odd. and yeah, he's not around. Unless we find out that she's been gone for months. Mademoiselle. Yeah, we could always find out that that happened. That's kind I... of how the story goes. <laughs> Maybe it would be really strange because, because like... they've been alluding to her. But you're right; I don't think she's been there. Yeah. She could be an Anatoly's. She's just like his girl on the side. Chambers. Yeah. She could be a a mademoiselle of the bedchamber. I just thought of that too. How like Andrew is a gentleman of the bedchamber. What the fuck and is that? Was that no Pierre explanation of what that is? Oh, maybe it was Pierre. You're right. It was someone weird. I mean, it was some. It was weird, whoever it was. Robert. It came across as a title, but without capitals. So it was like, is this something we're supposed to know about? Yeah, the way it was, the where it was in this sentence, it it did feel like it was a title. I'm not sure. Anyway, yeah. So Andrew proposed to Natasha, which she was thrilled. By. Ugh. Yeah. And um, Natasha had given up just before. Which was great. Was like that class. Oh, it was good. She like locked herself in a ballroom and just danced and like yeah. trumpeted. But yeah, her arrival in the club. And then it's that classic thing of like the second you give up, you give up. No, it's annoying. Yeah, I don't like that. It's contrived. It's like the opposite of the secret, right? No, that is the secret. That's the secret. Give up. Pretty much, guys. You. You gotta like put your order into the universe. Like, hey, I'd like a burger and fries. But is giving up the same is giving up and the same trust as letting that go. It'll come to you. Is giving up the same as letting go. Yeah. We should talk more about that. <laughs> <laughs> this requires scrutiny. Anyway, so they're they're engaged, but Andrew's father told him, although in in retrospect, this is kind of cruel that he t tells him this. Tells him to wait a year. So then Andrew waits a year. Um, he gets sick halfway and has to go hang out at spas in Switzerland. But they don't really explain what's wrong with him. He's just gone. And then... They he don't explain what's wrong with a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's really weird to be like, Andrew's sick, so he has to go, he has to go have yes. spa occasion. Yeah. Um, it is weird. But then he's like, hey, he writes to his sister and is like, hey, can you ask our esteemed father yeah. if he could just like cut four months off of the one year that he mandated? I don't know why he thinks this is going to go well. Because Mary's like, hey, want to cut four months? And he goes, I'll do something like that. Why don't we instead make him wait until I'm dead? Yeah. It's just like, so what's up with this year thing? It was just a ruse. He was just hoping that Andrew would change his mind. Yeah. But then when he didn't, he was like, psych. Into the frost. <laughs> the frost with you. He did say that. Not to Andrew, but yeah. Into the frost, into the frost. Like, that's another thing. I can see, like, I'm going to adopt that now. Into the frost. Into the frost. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I like it. Yeah, like when I'm stuck in traffic. Like a roll down the window. <laughs> <laughs> How confused would people be? I would love it. <laughs> if someone yelled that to me, I would love it. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait for traffic days now. Yeah. That's what I'm looking forward to. This is so uh, I think that's where we are. We're at. Yeah. Yeah. Are we missing anything? Princess Mary is that really depressing really end depressed. to the chapter by Princess Mary. Yes, yeah, she wants to become a pilgrim. It's her dearest wish to wear a rough cape and an even rougher <laughs> pair of undies <laughs> <laughs> and just. Just slum it. Pretty much. But she cannot because she loves her nephew. Coco. She loves her nephew and father. And then she condemns herself for that. Yeah. Because what a selfish brat. What a sinner. That you love your family. And they're not even that coarse. I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, rubbing myself on you. I bet he's coarse. Ew. Yeah. Okay. Uh, chapter, no, book seven, chapter one. This is 1810 to 1811. The Bible legend tells us that the absence of labor, idleness, was a condition of the first man's blessedness before the fall. Fallen man had retained a love of idleness, but the curse weighs on the race not only because we love to seek our bread in the sweat of our brows, <gasps> but because our moral nature is such that we cannot be both idle and at ease. Quarantine. <laughs> An inner voice tells us we are in the wrong if we are idle. Quarantine. If man could, say, could find a state in which he felt that though idle, he was fulfilling his duty. Taxes. He would have found one of the conditions of man's primitive blessedness. And such a state of obligatory and irreproachable idleness is the lot of a whole class. The military. The chief attraction of military service has consisted and will consist in this compulsory and irreproachable idleness. Actors too. No, I mean like there's a shit ton of idleness. Yeah, there is. Yeah. You like wait, 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 and then you get a job, and then you go to the job, and then you wait, 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 wait. wait. Yeah, and it's it's that annoying thing. It's like this is the job. This is part of the job. You sign up for this. Nicholas Rostov experienced this blissful condition to the full when, in 1807, he continued to serve in the Pavlograd Regiment, in which he already commanded the squadron he had taken over from Denisov. Rostov had become a bluff, good-natured fellow, whom... I thought a bluff was a thing. This is like that thing where I, like, I don't know what the sentences are. Had become a bluff. Sure. <laughs> That's like a Batman. Um... <laughs> Rostov had become a bluff, good-natured fellow, whom his Moscow acquaintances would have considered rather bad form, but who was liked and respected by his comrades, subordinates, and superiors, and was well contented with his life. Of late, in 1809, he found in letters from home more frequent complaints from his mother that their affairs were falling into greater and greater disorder, and that it was time for him to come back to gladden and comfort his old parents. Reading these letters, Nicholas felt a dread of their wanting to take him away from this, from surroundings in which, protected from all the entanglements of life, he was living so calmly and quietly. He felt that sooner or later he would have to re-enter that whirlpool of life with its embarrassments and affairs to be straightened out, its accounts with stewards, quarrels and intrigues, its ties, society, and with Sonia's love and his promise to her. It was all dreadfully difficult and complicated, and he replied to his mother in cold, formal letters in French, beginning, My dear Mama, and ending, Your obedient son, which said nothing of when he would return. In 1810, he received letters from his parents in which they told him of Natasha's engagement to Volkotsky and that the wedding would be in a year's time because the old prince made difficulties. This letter grieved and mortified Nicholas. In the first place, he was sorry that Natasha, for whom he cared more than for anyone else in the family, should be lost to the home. And secondly, from his Hazar point of view, he regretted not to have been there to show that fellow Volkonsky that connection with him was no such great honor after all, and that if he loved Natasha, he might dispense with permission from his dotard father. 
For a moment, he hesitated whether he should not apply for leave in order to see Natasha before she was married. But then came the maneuvers and considerations about Sonia and about the confusion of their affairs, and Nicholas again put it off. But in the spring of that year, he received a letter from his mother, written without his father's knowledge, and that letter persuaded him to return. She wrote that if he did not come and take matters in hand, their whole property would be sold by auction, and they would all have to go begging. The Count was so weak and trusted Mitenka so much, and was... Is that the next page? Oh, yeah. What the fuck is Mitenka? And was so good-natured that everybody took advantage of him, and things were going from bad to worse. For God's sake, I implore you, come at once if you do not wish to make me and the whole family wretched, wrote the Countess. This letter touched Nicholas. He <laughs> had that common sense of a matter-of-fact man which showed him what he ought to do. The right thing now was, if not to retire from the service, at any rate to go home on leave. Why he had to go, he did not know. But after his after-dinner nap, he gave orders to saddle Mars, an extremely vicious gray stallion that had not been ridden for a long time. And when he returned with the horse, all in a lather, he informed Lavrushka, Denisov's servant, who had remained with him, and his comrades, who turned up in the evening, that he was applying for leave and going home. Difficult and strange as it was for him to reflect that he would go away without having heard from the staff, and this interested him extremely, whether he was promoted to a captaincy or would receive the Order of St. Anne for the last maneuvers, strange as it was to think that he would go away without having sold his three rowans to the Polish Count Golkowski, who was bargaining for the horses Rostov had betted he would sell for 2,000 rubles. Incomprehensible as it seemed that the ball the hussars were, were giving in honor for the Polish Mademoiselle Przazdzieka out of rivalry to the Ulans, who had given one in honor of their Polish Mademoiselle Borzozowska, would take place without him. He knew he must go away from this good, bright world to somewhere where everything was stupid and confused. That's quite a sentence. Where did that sentence start? <laughs> uh, difficult and strange as it was for him to Oh reflect, my I god. Think. That's quite a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> a week later, he obtained his leave. His Hazar comrades, not only those of his own regiment, but the whole brigade gave Rostov a dinner in to which the subscription was 15 rubles a head and at which there were two bands and two choirs of singers. Rostov danced the trip up with Major Basov. The tipsy officers tossed, embraced, and dropped Rostov. <laughs> the soldiers of the third squadron tossed him too and shouted, Hurrah! And then they put him on his sleigh and escorted him as far as the first post station. During the first half of the journey from Kremenchug to Kiev, all Rostov's thoughts, as is usual in such cases, were behind him with the squadron. But when he had gone more than halfway, he began to forget his three rowans and Doshoyevieko, his quartermaster, and to wonder anxiously how things would be at Otrzno and what he would find there. Thoughts of home grew stronger the nearer he approached it, far stronger, as though this feeling of his was subject to the law by which the force of attraction is inverse proportion to the square of the distance. Getting mathy. Ah, wait. The force of the attraction is inverse proportion to the square of the distance. Okay, so it's just like, like the closer as he gets you are, close, yeah. the more attractive it becomes. Yeah. At the last post station before Ostrich to know, he gave the driver a three ask, rule ask a question tip. Huh? Oh, so sorry, but I want to ask a question. Une question. Oui, c'est quoi ton question? Oh. <laughs> okay, there might be a lag. I know, I can't read it from. I, I okay. thought that was the question. Um, he gave the driver a three-ruble tip, and on arriving, he ran breathlessly, like a boy, up the steps of his home. After the rapture of meeting, and after that odd feeling of unsatisfied expectation, the feeling that everything is just the same, so why did I hurry? Nicholas began to settle down in his old home world. His father and mother were much the same, only a little older. What was new in them was a certain uneasiness and occasional discord where they used not to be and which, as Nicholas soon found out, was due to the bad state of their affairs. Sonia was nearly twenty. She had stopped growing prettier and promised nothing more than she was already. But that was enough. 
She exhaled happiness and love from the time Nicholas returned, and the faithful, unalterable love of this girl had a gladdening effect on him. Petya and Natasha surprised Nicholas most. Petya was a big, handsome boy of 13, merry, witty, and mischievous, with a voice that was already breaking. As for Natasha, for a long while, Nicholas wondered and laughed whenever he looked at her. Okay, the question is, what? Um, yeah, we're reading War and Peace. That's what this is. <laughs> we're reading War and Peace. Welcome. And we're in, we're in book seven. Oh my god! <laughs> so I know that's a bit of a departure it's for a you. It's a far cry. It's a far. <laughs> Bam! Uh, but if you're up for it, we're happy to have you. Yeah, real comment. <laughs> cry. Um, you're not the same at all. He said. How? Am I uglier? On the contrary, but what dignity? A princess, he whispered to her. Yes, 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 cried Natasha joyfully. She told him about her romance with Prince Andrew and of his visit to Otra de Noe and showed him his last letter. Well, are you glad, Natasha asked. I am so tranquil and happy now. Very glad, answered Nicholas. He is an excellent fellow. And are you very much in love? How shall I put it, replied Natasha. I was in love with Boris, with my teacher, and with Denisov. But this is quite different. I feel at peace and settled. I know that no better man than he exists, and I am calm and contented now. Not at all as before. Nicholas expressed his disapproval of the postponement of the marriage for a year. But Natasha attacked her brother with exasperation, proving to him that it could not be otherwise, and that it would be a bad thing to enter a family against the father's will, and that she herself wished it so. You don't at all understand, she said. Nicholas was silent and agreed with her. Her brother often wondered as he looked at her. She did not seem at all like a girl in love and parted from her affianced husband. She was even tempered and calm and quite as cheerful as of old. This amazed Nicholas and even made him regard Volkonsky's courtship skeptically. He could not believe that her fate was sealed, especially as he had not seen her with Prince Andrew. It always seemed to him that there was something not quite right about this intended marriage. Why this delay? Why no betrothal? He thought. Once, when he had touched on this topic with his mother, he discovered, to his surprise and somewhat to his satisfaction, that in the depth of her soul, she too had doubts about this marriage. You see, he writes, said she showing her son a letter of Prince Andrew's with that latent grudge a mother always has in regard to a daughter's future married happiness. He writes that he won't come before December. What can be keeping him? Illness, probably. Probably. His health is very delicate. Don't tell Natasha. And don't attach importance to her being so bright. That's because she's living through the last days of her girlhood. But I know what she is like every time we receive a letter from him. However, God grant that everything turns out well. She always ended with these words. He's an excellent man. Mm. These are good last words. What was it again? I don't know. <laughs> She's living through the last, but I know. God grant that everything turns out well. Inshallah. <laughs> also known as. He is an excellent man. Uh, Phil! What's your language, Phil? And thanks. Just try to follow as best you can. Uh, Chapter two. two. After reaching home, Nicholas was at first serious and even dull. He was worried by the impending necessity of interfering in the stupid business matters for which his mother had called him home. To throw off this burden as quickly as possible, on the third day after his arrival, he went, angry and scowling and without answering questions as to where he was going, to Matenka's lodge and demanded an account of everything. But what an account of everything might be, Nicholas knew even less than the frightened and bewildered Matenka. The conversation and the examination of the accounts with Matenka did not last long. The village elder, a peasant delegate, and the village clerk, who was waiting in the passage, heard with fear and delight first the young Count's voice roaring and snapping and rising louder and louder, and then words of abuse, dreadful words, ejaculated one after the other. Robber, ungrateful wretch, I'll hack the dog to pieces. I am not my father, robbing us, and so on. 
Then, with no less fear and delight, they saw how the young count, red in the face and with bloodshot eyes, dragged Matenka out by the scruff of the neck and applied his foot and knee to his behind with great agility at convenient moments between the words, shouting, Be off! Here. Never let me see your face! Here, again! You villain! Matenka flew headlong down the six steps and ran away into the shrubbery. The shrubbery was a well-known haven of refuge for culprits at Otradno. Medenka himself, returning tipsy from the town, used to hide there, and many of the residents at Otradno, hiding from Medenka, knew of its protective qualities. Cool. We now know more about the shrubbery than a lot of characters in the book. Cool. Matanka's wife and sisters-in-law thrust their heads and frightened faces out of the door of a room where a bright samovar was boiling and where the steward's high bedstead stood with its patchwork quilt. The young count paid no heed to them, but breathing hard, passed by with resolute strides and went into the house. Countess, who heard at once from the maids what had happened at the lodge, was calmed by the thought that now their affairs would certainly improve, but on the other hand felt anxious as to the effect this excitement might have on her son. She went several times to his door on tiptoe and listened, as he lighted one pipe after another. Next day, the old count called his son aside and with an embarrassed smile said to him, But you know, my dear boy, it's a pity you got excited. Matenka has told me all about it. I knew, thought Nicholas, that I should never understand anything in this crazy world. You were angry that he had not entered those 700 rubles. But they were carried forward, and you did not look at the other page. Papa, he is a blackguard and a thief. I know he is, and what I have done, I have done. But if you like, I won't speak to him again. No, oh, my dear boy, the Count too felt embarrassed. He knew he had mismanaged his wife's property and was to blame toward his children, but he did not know how to remedy it. No, I beg you to attend to the business. I am old. I No, Papa, forgive me if I have caused you unpleasantness. I understand it all less than you do. Do you know what's going on? Yeah. Why is he why is he punishing this? Because he's convinced that the guy has been cheating him. Who is he then? The accountant. The accountant. And it's not their mismanagement? Whose? The Rostovs. Well. Mm. It's not mm. clear. What is clear is that the shrubbery is a great place to hide. <laughs> that's that's crystal. Devil take all these peasants and money matters and carryings forward from page to page, he thought. I used to understand what a corner and the stakes at cards meant, but carrying forward to another page I don't understand at all, said he to himself. And after that, he did not meddle in business affairs. But once the countess called her son and informed him that she had a promissory note from Anna Mikhailovna for 2,000 rubles and asked him what he thought of doing with it. This, answered Nicholas, you say it rests with me? Well, I don't like Anna Mikhailovna and I don't like Boris. But they were our friends and poor. Well then, this. And he tore up the note and by doing so caused the old countess to weep tears of joy. After that, young Rostov took no further part in any business affairs but devoted himself with passionate enthusiasm to what was to him a new pursuit, the chase, for which his father kept a large establishment. Into the chips. What's your name? Mm. No idea. Okay. I mean, it sounds like, well, his father kept a place, I don't know, a large establishment? Perhaps well, we are to find out. We shall. Chapter 3. The weather was already growing wintry, and morning frosts congealed an earth saturated by autumn rains. The verdure had thickened, and its bright green stood out sharply against the brownish strips of winter rye trodden down by the cattle and against the pale yellow stubble of the spring buckwheat. The wooded ravines and the copses, which at the end of August had still been green islands amid black fields and stubble, had become golden and bright red islands amid the green winter rye. The hares had already half changed their summer coats, the fox cubs were beginning to scatter, and the young wolves were bigger than dogs. It was the best time of the year for the chase. The hounds of that ardent young sportsman Rostov had not merely reached hard what? The hounds of that ardent young sportsman Rostov had not merely reached hard winter condition, but were so jaded that at a meeting of the huntsmen it was decided to give them a three days rest, and then, on the sixteenth of September, 
to go on a distant expedition, starting from the oak grove where there was an undisturbed litter of wolf cubs. All that day, the hounds remained at home. It was frosty and the air was sharp, but toward evening, the sky became overcast and it began to thaw. On the 15th, when young Rostov, in his dressing gown, looked out of the window, he saw it was an insurpassable morning for hunting. It was as if the sky were melting and sinking to the earth without any wind. The only motion in the air was that of the dripping microscopic particles of drizzling mist. The bare twigs in the garden were hung with transparent drops which fell on the freshly falling leaves. The earth in the kitchen garden looked wet and black and glistened like poppy seed and at a short distance merged into the dull, moist veil of mist. Nicholas went out into the wet and muddy porch. There was a smell of decaying leaves and of dog. Milka, a black-spotted, broad-haunched bitch with prominent black eyes, got up on seeing her mas master, stretched her hind legs, lay down like a hare, and then suddenly jumped up and licked him right on his nose and mustache. Another borzoi, a dog, Catching sight of his master from the garden path, arched his back and rushing headlong toward the porch with lifted tail, began rubbing himself against his legs. Ahoy! came at that moment, that inimitable huntsman's call, which unites the deepest bass with the shrillest tenor. And round the corner came Daniel, the head huntsman and head kennelman, a gray, wrinkled old man with a hair cut straight over his forehead, Ukrainian fashion a long bent whip in his hand, and that look of independence and scorn of everything that is only seen in Huntsman. He doffed his Circassian cap to his master and looked at him scornfully. His scorn was not offensive to his master. Nicholas knew that this Daniel, disdainful of everybody, and who considered himself above them, was all the same his serf and Huntsman. Daniel, Nicholas said timidly, conscious at the sight of the weather, the hounds, and the Huntsman, that he was being carried away by that irresistible passion for sport, which makes a man forget all his previous resolutions, as a lover forgets in the presence of his mistress. What orders, Your Excellency? said the huntsman in his deep bass. Deep, as a proto-deacon's and horse with hallooing, <laughs> with two flashing black eyes gazed from under his brows at his master, who was silent. Can you resist it? Those eyes seemed to be asking. It's a good day, eh? For a hunt and a gallop, eh? Asked Nicholas, scratching Milka behind the ears. Daniel did not answer, but winked instead. Oh, Daniel. <laughs> like, Daniel's porch. pretty sexy. Oh, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> um, I said to you, Varka, at dawn to listen. His bass boomed out after a minute's pause. He said she's moved them into the Otter's No enclosure. They were howling there. This meant that the she-wolf, about whom they both knew, had moved with her cubs to the Ochardino Copse, a small place a mile and a half from the house. We ought to go, don't you think so? said Nicholas. Come to me with Uvarka. As you please. Then put off feeding them. Yes, sir. Five minutes later, Daniel and Uvarka were standing in Nicholas's big study. Though Daniel was not a big man, to see him in a room was like seeing a horse or a bear in the on the floor among the furniture and surroundings of human life. Daniel himself felt this, and as usual stood just inside the door trying to speak softly and not move for fear of breaking something in his master's apartment. And he hastened to say all that was necessary so as to get from under that ceiling out into the open under the sky once more. Having finished his inqu inquiries and extorted from Daniel an opinion that the hounds were fit, Daniel himself wished to go hunting. Nicholas ordered the horses to be saddled, but just as Daniel was about to go, Natasha came in with rapid steps, not having done up her hair or finished dressing, and with her old nurse's big shawl wrapped round her. Hedia ran in at the same time. Hey. You are going, asked Natasha. I knew you would, Sonia said you wouldn't go, but I knew that today was the sort of day when you couldn't help going. Yes, we are going, replied Nicholas reluctantly. For today, as he intended to hunt seriously, he did not want to take Natasha and Petya. We are going, but only wolf hunting. It would be dull for you. You know it is my greatest pleasure, said Natasha. It's not fair. You are going by yourself, are having the horses saddled, and said nothing to us about it. No barrier bars a Russian's path. We'll go, shouted Petya. 
But you can't. Mama said you mustn't, said Nicholas to Natasha. Yes, I'll go. I shall certainly go, said Natasha decisively. Daniel, take them to saddle for us. Tell them to saddle for us. And Michael must come with my dogs, she added to the huntsman. It seems to Daniel irksome and improper to be in a room at all. But to have anything to do with a young lady seemed to him impossible. He cast down his eyes and hurried out as if it was none of his business, careful as he went, not to inflict any accidental injury on the young lady. Oh, Daniel. Daniel. Oh, Danny boy. Chapter 4. The old count, who had always kept up an, um, an enormous hunting establishment, but had now handed it all completely over to his son's care, being in very good spirits on this 15th of September, prepared to go out with the orders. With the others. With the others. In an hour's time, the whole hunting party was at the porch. Nicholas, with a stern and serious air, which showed that now was no time for attending to trifles, went past Natasha and Petya, who were trying to tell him something. He had a look at all the details of the hunt, sent a pack of hounds and huntsmen on ahead to find the quarry, mounted his chestnut donets, and whistling to his own leash of bourgeois, set off across the threshing ground to a field leading to the Otradno wood. The old count's horse, a sorrel gelding called Viflianka, was led by the groom in attendance on him, while the count himself was to drive in a small trap straight to a spot reserved for him. They were taking 54 hounds Jesus. with six hunt attendants. Maybe what, sell some of your fracking. That's what I'm saying. I don't think they're hard out. 54 hounds? How much dog food is that? It's like a lot of rabbits. They are taking 54 hounds with six hunt attendants and whippers in. Besides the family, there were eight Borzoi kennelmen and more than 40 bourgeois, so that with a bourgeois on the leash belonging to members of the family, there were about 130 dogs and 20 horsemen. Each dog, and this is for what, sport? Yeah, cool. They're, they're catching wolves. Why? I don't know. Because they're huntsmen now. Suddenly we're in a hunting movie. So strange. Each dog knew its master and its call. Each man in the hunt knew his business, his place, what he had to do. As soon as they had passed the fence, they all spread out evenly and quietly, without noise or talk, along the road and field leading to the Otradno covert. The horses okay. stepped over the field as over a thick carpet, now and then splashing into puddles as they crossed a road. The misty sky still seemed to descend evenly and imperceptibly toward the earth. The air was still, warm, and silent. Occasionally, the whistle of a huntsman, the snort of a horse, the crack of a whip, or the whine of a straggling hound could be heard. When they had gone a little less than a mile, five more riders with dogs appeared out of the mist, approaching the Rostovs. In front rode a fresh-looking, handsome old man with a large grey moustache. Good morning, uncle, said Nicholas, when the old man drew near. That's it, come on. I was sure of it, began uncle. He was a distant relative of the Rostovs, a man of small means, and their neighbour. I knew you wouldn't be able to resist it, and it's a good thing you're going. That's it, come on. This was uncle's favorite expression. Take the cover at once, for my imperceptibly, for what? A A skipped. For my gurchik. Yeah. Take the co covert at once, for my Gertrick says the Illigans are at Corniki with their <laughs> hounds. That's it. Come on, they'll take the cubs from under your very nose. That's where I'm going. Shall we join our packs? asked Nicholas. The hounds are joined at one pack. And the 140 plus the five? Yeah. One pack. I don't know what I would do if I saw 100 hounds in one place. I mean, I don't think they're all that fast. <laughs> This is a mass. Dog, 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 dog. Yeah. Hound, 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 hound. The hounds are joined into one pack, and Uncle and Nicholas rode on side by side. 
Natasha, muffled up in shawls which did not hide her eager face and shining eyes, galloped up to them. She was followed by Petya, who always kept close to her, by Michael, a huntsman, and by a groom appointed to look after her. Petya, who was laughing, whipped and pulled at his horse. Natasha sat easily and confidently on her black Arab chick and reined him in without effort with a firm hand. Uncle looked around disapprovingly at Petya and Natasha. He did not like to combine frivolity with the serious business of hunting. Morning, Uncle. You're hmm. going too, hmm. shouted Petya. Good morning, good morning. But don't go overriding the hounds, said Uncle stubbornly. Nicholas, what a fine dog Trunala is. He knew me, said Natasha, referring to her favorite hound. In the first place, Trunilla is not a dog, but a harrier, thought Nicholas, and, looking, and looked sternly at his sister, trying to make her feel the distance that ought to separate them at that moment. Natasha understood it. You mustn't think we'll be in anyone's way, uncle, she said. We'll go to our places and won't budge. Good thing too, little countess, said uncle. Only mind you don't fall off your horse, he added, because that's it. Come on. You have nothing to hold on to. The oasis of the Otterno Covert came in sight of a few hundred yards off. The huntsmen were already nearing it. Rostov, having finally settled with Uncle. Why do they keep going Uncle? Because that's not his name. Great. Right. But he's their uncle, right? I mean, only sort of. Okay. Uncle. I don't know why they keep going. Where they should set on the hounds. And having shown Natasha where she was to stand a spot where nothing could possibly run out, went round above the ravine. Well, nephew, you're going for a big wolf, said uncle. Mind and don't let her slip. You be these pieces of shit. <laughs> yep, that's as may happen, answered Rostov. Hooray, here, he shouted, answering uncle's remark by this call towards bourgeois. Hooray was a shaggy old dog with a hanging jowl. Mm -hmm. Famous for having tackled a big wolf unaided. They all took up their places. The old count, knowing his son's ardor in the hunt, hurried so as not to be late, and the huntsmen had not yet reached their places when Count Ilya Rostov, cheerful, flushed, and with quivering cheeks, drove up with his black horses over the winter ride to the place reserved for him, where a wolf might come out. Having straightened his coat and fastened on his hunting knives and horn, he he mounted his good, sleek, well-fed and comfortable horse, Viflianka, which was turning gray like himself. His horses and trap were sent home. Count Ilya Rostov, though not at heart a keen sportsman, knew the rules of the hunt well and rode to the bushy edge of the road where he was to stand, arranged his reins, settled himself in the saddle and feeling that he was ready, looked about with a smile. <coughs> Beside him was Simon Shekmar, his personal attendant, an old horseman, now somewhat stiff in the saddle. Chekmar held in leash three formidable wolfhounds, who had, however, grown fat like their master and his horse. Two wise old dogs lay down unleashed. Some hundred paces farther along the edge of the wood stood, stood Mitka, the Count's other groom, a daring horseman and keen rider to hounds. Before the hunt, by old custom, the Count had drunk a silver cupful of mulled brandy, taken a snack, and washed it down with half a bottle of his favorite Bordeaux. He was somewhat flushed with the wine and the drive. Such a good idea to get drunk before hunting. Before hunting. That's really good. As is custom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was somewhat flushed with the wine and the drive. His eyes were rather moist and glittered more than usual, and as he sat in his saddle wrapped up in his fur coat, he looked like a child taken out for an outing. The thin, hollow-cheeked Chekmar, having got everything ready, kept glancing at his master, with whom he had lived on the best of terms for 30 years, and understanding the mood he was in, expected a pleasant chat. A third person, sorry. Oh, it's okay. I can tell if that's... Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. A third person rode up circumspectly through the wood. It was plain that he had had a lesson, and stopped behind the count. This person was a gray-bearded old man in a woman's cloak with a tall peaked cap on his head. He was the buffoon who went by a woman's name, Natasya Ivanovna. Interesting. Nas Nastasia Ivanovna. Well, Nastasia Ivanovna, whispered the count, winking at him. If you scare away the beast, the annual will give it to you. I know a thing or two myself, said Nastasia Ivanovna. <laughs> 
whispered the count. And sorry, I'm flushed from the brandy. Seriously, whispered the count and turned to Simon. Have you seen the young countess? He asked. Where is she? With young Count Peter by the Zara of rank grass, answered Simon, smiling. Though she's a lady, she's very fond of hunting. And you're surprised at the way she rides, Simon, eh? Said the Count. She's as good as many a man. Of course, it's marvelous. So bold, so easy. And Nicholas, where is he? By the Liadov upland, isn't he? Yes, sir. He knows where to stand. Mm. He understands the matter so well that Daniel and I are often quite astounded, Never said again. Simon, well knowing what would please his master. Rides well, eh? And how well he looks on his horse, eh? A perfect picture. How he chased a fox out of the rank grass by the Zavar, the Zavar Zinks thicket the other day. It leaped a fearful place. What a sight when they rushed from the covert. The horse worth a thousand rubles and the rider beyond all price. Yes, one would have to search far to find another as smart. To search far, repeated the Count. Evidently, sorry, Simon had not said more. To search far, he said, <laughs> turning back the skirt of his coat to get at his snuff box. The other day when he came out from mass in full uniform, Michael Sidoriak, Simon did not finish, for on the still air he had distinctly caught the music of the hunt, with only two or three hounds giving tongue. He bent down his head and listened, shaking a warning finger at his master. They are on the scent of the cubs, he whispered, straight to the Leodav uplands. The Count, forgetting to smooth out the smile on his face, looked into the distance straight before him, down the narrow open space, holding the snuff box in his hand, but not taking any. After the cry of the hounds came the deep tones of the wolf call from Daniel's hunting horn. The pack joined the first three hounds and they could be heard in full cry with that peculiar lift in the note that indicates that they are after a wolf. The whippers in no longer set on the hounds but changed to the cry of Uli Uli U. And above the others rose Daniel's voice, now a deep bass, now piercingly shrill. His voice seemed to fill the whole wood and carry far beyond out into the open field. So he's like, <laughs> <laughs> After listening a few moments in silence, the Count and his attendant convinced themselves that the hounds had separated into two packs. The sound of the larger pack, eagerly giving tongue, began to die away in the distance. The other pack rushed by the wood past the count, and it was with this that Daniel's voice was heard calling Ooh, you, you. <laughs> The sounds of both packs mingled and broke apart again, but both were becoming more distant. Simon sighed and stooped to straighten the leash a young Borzoi had entangled. The count too sighed, and noticing the snuff box in his hand, opened it and took a pinch. Back, cried Simon. To Simon? <laughs> <laughs> Simon? Back, cried Simon to a borzoi that was pushing forward out of the wood. The count started and dropped the snuffbox. Nastasia Ivanovna dismounted to pick it up. The count and Simon were looking at him. Then, oh, Jesus. unexpectedly, as often happens, the sound of the hunt suddenly approached, as if the hounds in full cry and Daniel Uliuliuling <laughs> were just in front of them. The Count turned and saw on his right Mitka staring at him with eyes starting out of his head, raising his cap and pointing before him to the other side. Look out! He shouted in a voice plainly showing that he had long fretted to utter that word. And letting the bourgeois slip, he galloped toward the Count. The Count and Simon galloped out of the wood and saw on their left a wolf, which softly swaying from side to side was coming at a quiet, quiet look farther to the left to the very place where they were standing. The angry bourgeois whined, and getting free off the leash, rushed past the horse's feet at the wolf. The wolf paused, turned, turned its heavy forehead toward the dogs awkwardly, like a man suffering from the quinsy, and still slightly swaying from side to side, gave a couple of leaps, and with a swish of its tail, disappeared into the skirt of the wood. At the same instant, with a cry like a wail, first one hound, then another, and then another, sprang helter-skelter from the wood opposite, and the whole pack rushed across the field toward the very spot where the wolf had disappeared. The hazel bushes parted behind the hounds, and Daniel's chestnut horse appeared, dark with sweat. On its long back sat Daniel, hunched forward, capless, 
his disheveled gray hair hanging over his flushed, perspiring face. <laughs> when he caught sight of the count, his eyes flashed lightning. Blast you, he shouted, holding up his whip threateningly at the count. What? You've let the wolf go. What sportsman? And as if scorning to say more to the frightened and shame-faced count, he lashed the heaving flanks of his sweating chestnut, gelding with all the anger the count had aroused, and flew off after the hounds. The count, like a punished schoolboy, looked round, trying by a smile to win Simon's sympathy for his plight. But Simon was no longer there. He was galloping round by the bushes while the field was coming up on both sides, all trying to head the wolf, but it vanished into the wood before they could do so. Hmm. I'm sorry. Why do we care about any of this? Oh, that's why I'm like, Tulsa, what are you doing? I think it's just like, hunting. And then he, he goes and he writes down some chapters on hunting. I mean, I feel pretty sure that Rostov's gonna die. Yeah, you, you really feel like old Ilya, right? Yeah, because we've never thought about him this much. He, he threw a dinner party once, right? See, you don't even know. I think that was him, and he was very concerned that it was gonna go well, and he had all his dishes. Remember in the mayonnaise soup? I think that was him. That was him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Grotesque. Um. <laughs> I want to throw a dinner party and throw a out. Why don't you? Like, this is a classic Russian dish. What do you do not like? It's turtle. Oh. It's turtles. Turtle soup. <laughs> And like, fuck these guys with their stupid dogs and like, what is the matter with everyone? He's like, you let the wolf, I mean, sorry, what, why don't you fucking calm yourself? <laughs> like, what is this deal? This is life. I think. This is more intensity than any of the war scenes. Actually, that's true. He's like, oh, you. <laughs> I mean, calm down, Daniel. He's like, kind of curious that the wolf comes out and they all just stare at him. Okay. Isn't that what they're there for? Yeah, but they're in the place where definitely the wolf is not coming. Yeah. So it's a little like, oh! The wolf. <laughs> huh? Where's its pack? I know. Why don't you just leave the wolf be? I don't understand why you're doing that. Yeah. This this isn't gonna go well. Either someone dies or the wolf dies. Ugh. Or both. Who let the wolves out? Go. Is that a song? Rostov. 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 Yeah. Who let the dogs out? Oh yeah, got it. It's not who let the wolves out. <laughs> I got a text massage. Sing. Who let the wolves out? Who? 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 <laughs> Who? <laughs> uh, you want to keep going? We could do one more. I'm mad. Yeah. It's also a mad. <laughs> it's a good thing we're doing this. I go to sleep livid every night. Did you have any nightmares last night? I don't think so. Or vivid dreams. That um, person who wrote that article was a dongle. It was kind of a useless article. You like read the, it, right? The headline like, was much better than the actual article. It was basically just like, we're living in an uncertain time, so like, it makes sense that your sleep is disturbed. It's stressful, and when you're disturbed, you're more likely to wake up while you're dreaming. But it did say that REM sleep was the lightest sleep. I got confused by that. Yeah, that's the opposite. Isn't it the opposite? I think th what she was trying to say is like the reason why people are remembering their dreams is because we're sleeping lighter. So like we're coming out of REM more often and remembering them more. I'm not sure. Well, she's saying you have to be mid dream in order to remember when you wake up in order to remember said dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I was disappointed. So. Did you have Mike Miz? I had tweens. I can't remember what they were. Sometimes when I go, do you ever have this where like you you wake up and you can remember your dream and then you go about your day and you have no idea and then when you go back to bed, it comes back to you? No. But I don't think I remember my dreams nearly as much as you do. Yeah. Which might be how I am most. It is. Speculating on your dreams doesn't actually do very much. Really? Yeah. How would you know? You don't know what it's like to not. Oh, yeah. Maybe it's been so useful. You don't even know it. Oh. 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 Chapter five. One more. And Phil, I don't know Turkish. You don't? I don't, surprisingly. But that's really cool that we've reached Turkey. Might not be in Turkey, but yeah. Well, yeah, that's possible. I want to go to Turkey one day. My mom has been. Oh, I actually loved that. Mm -hmm. Loved it. And my friend who lives near here is married to a lady from Turkey. Yeah. That's mm. that's about it. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our Turkish food's quite good. Or at least it was when I used to eat meat. Yeah, what is it? It's like eggplant meat tomato like, goodness. Like kind of like Israeli? Yeah, I think. I think. Hummus? I don't Hummus remember they do hummus, but they probably do it. Mm -hmm. I feel like most, um, all of that, that whole swab of countries does something. Yeah, I love that. So good. Oh, do you like hummus? Oh, yeah, I know. Cal surprise. Cal surprise. But like, I love how they all do it a little bit differently. Yeah. I don't really know how they do it differently. Why don't you do a hummus flight? Like store-bought? No. What do you, what do you take me for? Uh, <laughs> some kind of hummus know-nothing? Have you ever made hummus? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, never. Uh, no, I don't think I have. Sam was in a phase like ten years ago when he was making it mm -hmm. quite a bit. Yeah, and I was around for that a lot, so I like in my mind feel like, okay. but I never actually did it. Did he used to peel the chickpeas? I don't think so. It's like this extra step that I don't know if it's worth it. Like you take the skins off. Why do you do that? Makes it smoother. Yeah. Why you just like brrrr it for longer? Wait, I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. Um, I'm gonna make hummus. And you know what I could do if I made hummus? We would have aquafaba. Yeah. I don't know what I'm always just like <laughs> listening to this for. Because more than listening to this, yeah. What I would like to be doing yeah, would be eating. eating it. Right. Yeah. All talk and no hummus. I know. Mix. One day, one day you're just going to wake up, and the kitchen's going to be like, and I've been baking all night. Yeah. Once again, I'm hearing about this okay, happening. Okay. 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 Well, okay. don't do that because that seems like a strain. No, I, I hope this will happen. Uh, we're under the pie. That's what I want to know. I know, but it's a time commitment. It is? Yeah. I thought you said it was so easy even dongles can do it. Or was that the... A crisp is like... You need fat, sugar, and the oats. And then you cut up apples, throw some brown sugar on that, maybe some cinnamons. And then you want to make sure that the like oaty bits are chunky though. 
because those are the best pieces. You don't want it all like crumbly. No. Like you want it to look like stuck like granola. You're basically making really sugary granola. I'm gonna put that over the apples. My savory crumble. I know. Why was it salty? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I wonder if like you had added cheese to that, whether like you could have I don't like the like you could have made it cheese thing. I, yeah, I've tried I've, I've tried it because it sounds sophisticated. But I don't know. Cheese. It's like apple and cheddar. Like I think it's specific cheeses. I don't think apple and cheddar go well. No. I mean, maybe it is that, and maybe it is specific. I don't remember, but I don't think I would like that. That's what I mean. But it is. Yeah, like cheese on apple pie. That's a thing. It is? Yeah. Wherefore? Like, ice cream is a kind of cheese. <laughs> no, because isn't cheese like fermented or some like it's like rotted or something? Kind of, it's like yogurt. What's the difference between yogurt and cheese, really? I no one's know. like, oh, cheese is good for your digestion. That's because it's got no probiotic value. That's mm -hmm. what makes um, that, that's what makes yogurt. Yeah, like meat. But like live cultures. Mm -hmm. There's nothing alive in cheese, but isn't know. there? I'm kind of horrified by cheese, to be honest. And I don't like the word either. Cheese. I used to only be able to eat cheese if it was really skinny. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> like. Like, I couldn't eat, you know how, like, some people can, like, eat cheese in cubes? Mm -hmm. Um, I couldn't do that. I thought that was disgusting. Only well, slices. I could only, we used to have, like, like a potato peeler. And I would peel the cheese and make it as thin, thin, thin as possible. And I would eat it like that. So. That sounds good. That, that sounds better to me than, like, ooh like a mass of cheese, which when I think a lot about cheese, I mostly think of it in like large quantities and it makes me feel a bit like, I think that's what it is. Yeah. That makes me feel like uh, grossed out or whatever. On rain, the set deck, we used to often have to have um, these tables full of cheese and fruit. <laughs> <laughs> and after 16 hours of shooting, Ew. under hot lights, that starts to smell rank. Really? Oh, yeah. That's disgusting. Oh, God. <clears throat> Apparently in commercials for, for, like, food, the food is disgusting. And there's, like, a spit bucket. The food is disgusting? So you do, like, a McDonald's commercial. There's, like fuck down and make of hamburgers that you have to eat or whatever the thing yeah, is. Yeah. And uh apparently like no one cares if it's good. Because they're just like it needs to be hot for it to be good, right? Right. Something like McDonald's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it sort of turns horrifying as it oh, gets colder. And right. I think they don't give a shit about that. And there's also like a bucket. So you're always like, um and then like mmm <laughs> oh, <whatever>. <laughs> <Ew>. <laughs> And then when it's over, when the shot is done, you're like, Pow. "That's disgusting." Well, you're so you don't eat all day. <laughs> what do they do with the bucket? They feed it to the tigers, mm. or to the people taking care of the tigers. I'm not tracking tiger food. I don't know why that was the most disturbing part of that. Expired meat. Well, you've brought it up before. I still haven't seen it. No, I need to. There's too many things to watch. Are there? 
There's I feel like there's not enough like crimey shit. No, it's me. weird when someone's like, "You haven't watched this. You need to watch this." Hi. No, you don't. Well, it depends on what it is. No, you're fine without watching it. You're fine. It, okay, there's certain things. I that don't I'm think like, you're fine for not having seen Kung Fu Panda. Okay. <sighs> Maybe not. But that's what's been missing. That's that is fine. what's missing. You know how you're always looking for missing. <laughs> that's the thing. It's Kung Fu Panda. I really. Imagine if it is. I mean, it is, so. And I, yeah, just like tomorrow, I come out of the bedroom and I'm changed. Remarkably. There's a soft glow that emanates from me. Mm-hmm. And you're like, what was that? I mean, there's probably like. I'm pretty sure that's all that Osha did. Osho? Yeah. Watch Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> like in the future. I mean, I'm sure. I don't. I haven't seen a lot of like, uh, movies about. Um, like I haven't seen a lot of martial arts movies and shit. Mm-hmm. I'm sure Kung Fu Panda is like a horrible ripoff of many, oh, like right. many yeah. well done and culturally. Uh, more appropriate renditions of these ideas. Yeah. But. Yeah, I haven't seen a lot of those things either. Like, I've never seen Karate Kid. That's not what I was talking about, but. I No, but that's the one basic one that most people have seen, and I've never seen that. I'm talking about, like, Bruce Lee stuff. Yeah, Bruce Lee or, like, Seven Samurai. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wasn't talking about Karate Kid, but he was my first love. Really? Oh yeah, and so worthy. Okay. <laughs> so worthy. Yeah, like, like I didn't grow up and be well like, done. "Whoa, what?" Good first love. Yeah, I still am like. Oh. 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 So sweet. I lived in Reseda. Yeah. Yeah, which sounded like, like I didn't. It's so weird when you like move from. A place and then go somewhere where actually there is the literal context for this something that's only a sound to you yeah like I remember seeing this movie where they said the word California a lot a lot right. and I like knew that's not quite like Reseda because California had more of a concept for it yeah but it's so funny and stuff like that like I think I listened to that's when I was a kid, that Simon and Garfunkel concert in Central Park. Not I think, I did. Mm-hmm. Um, like in my family, like in that house, it was so, um, it was so common. And there were things like, like at some point, point Paul Simon is talking and he's like, I hope we're blasting Central Park West and Fifth Avenue pretty much away. And I remember being like, what? Big Latin is he yeah, talking yeah. about that he's saying, I was like, what is Central Park West End Fifth Avenue? Because West seems like it should come before a thing. Yeah. And I didn't like no, I didn't realize that Central Park West was a, I don't know. And then you got to go there. No, I lived there for many years. And I was like, oh, Central Park West. Did it live up to the dream? Okay. Yeah. And they have a lot of they had a lot of songs about New York, and I like my they, they were playing a lot in my house when I was a kid, so I had a lot of time got home from New York. So sweet. Anyway, Rosita didn't live up. <laughs> have you been well, there? Yeah, Reseda's like not, it's in the valley. It's not far from. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh. And he moved from Jersey, which again, like now I have all these like cultural contexts for what was happening in the Karate Kid, which is he had moved from Jersey to Reseda. Yeah. And was all out of place.
Rosita sucked. He was upset about it. And Rosita does That's suck. That's thing. I haven't seen it. You haven't seen Rosita? But I think there's seen? also something, like, romantic about those shitty places. Shitty. Sorry, Rosita. In a movie, in a movie, you know, like, the suburbs are really attractive. Depends on the movie, doesn't it? Like, there's something really sweet about that. Like even though I think I think of like Ferris Bueller or like there's something about that kind of life depending on where you grow up. Yeah, I'm sure it depends on where you grow up. I do remember as a kid being like, this doesn't seem so bad, and he was like, oh, Rosita. Like I didn't have. Yeah. I was like, they have a swimming pool. I don't know. <laughs> Which is cool. Yeah. Why is it not cool? There's all these neighbors. I don't know. I didn't know. I didn't get why why it sucked. Mm. I still don't. Let's move. Let's go. Let's go there. Chapter five, the final chapter. Mm -hmm. Ready? Yes. Nicholas Rostov, meanwhile, remained at his post, waiting for the wolf. By the way, the hunt approached and receded, the cry receded, the, by the cries of the dogs, whose notes were familiar to him. By the way, the voices of the huntsmen approached, receded, and rose. He realized what was happening at the copse. He knew that young and old wolves were there, that the hounds had separated into two packs, that somewhere a wolf was being chased, and that something had gone wrong. He expected the wolf to come his way at any moment. He made thousands of different conjectures as to where and from what side the beast would come and how he would set upon it. Hope alternated with despair. Several times he addressed a prayer to God that the wolf should come his way. He prayed with that passionate and shamefaced feeling with which men pray at moments of great excitement arising from trivial causes. What would it be to thee to do this for me, he said to God. I know thou art great, and that it is a sin to ask this of thee, but for God's sake do let the old wolf come my way and let Carrie spring at it in sight of Uncle was watching from over there and seized it by the throat in a death grip. A thousand times during that half hour, Rostov cast eager and restless glances over the edge of the wood with the two scraggy oaks rising above the aspen undergrowth and the gully with its water-worn side and Uncle's cap just visible above the bush on his right. No, I shan't have such luck, thought Rostov. Yet what wouldn't it be worth? It is not to be everywhere at cards and in war. I am always unlucky. Memories of Austerlitz and of Dolokhov flashed rapidly and clearly through his mind. Only once in my life to get an old wolf. I want only that, thought he, straining eyes and ears and looking to the left and then to the right and listening to the slightest variation of note in the cries of the dogs. Again, he looked to the right and saw something running towards him across the desert. Oh my God, the deserted field. No, it can't be, thought Rostov, taking a deep breath as a man does at the coming of something long hoped for. The height of happiness was reached, and so simply, without warning or noise or display, that Rostov could not believe his eyes and remained in doubt for over a second. The wolf ran forward and jumped heavily over a gully that lay in her paw. She was an old animal with a gray back and big reddish belly. She ran without hurry, evidently feeling sure that no one saw her. Rostov, holding his breath, looked around at the, looked round at the bozoi. They stood or lay, not seeing the wolf or understanding the situation. Old Carrie had turned his head and was angrily searching for fleas, <laughs> baring his yellow teeth and snapping at his hind legs. <laughs> whispered Rostov, pouting his lips. The boar's wire jumped up, jerking the rings of the leashes and pricking their ears. Carre finished scratching his hindquarters and cocking his ears, got up with quivering tail from which tufts of matted hair hung down. Shall I loose them or not? Nicholas asked himself as the wolf approached him, coming from the copse. Suddenly, the wolf's whole physio physiognomy changed. She shuddered, seeing what she had probably never seen before. Human eyes fixed upon her, and turning her head a little toward Rostov, she paused. Back or forward? Ugh, no matter, forward. The wolf seemed to say to herself, and she moved forward without again looking round, and with a quiet, long, easy, yet resolute lope. Ooh, 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 ooh. 
cried Nicholas in a voice not his own, and of its own accord, his good horse darted headlong downhill, leaping over gullies to head off the wolf, and the bourgeois passed it, running faster still. Nicholas did not hear his own cry, nor feel that he was galloping, nor see the bourgeois, nor the ground over which he went. He saw only the wolf, who, increasing her speed, bounded on in the same direction along the hollow. The first to come into view was Milka, with, his, with her black markings and powerful quarters gaining upon the wolf. Nearer and nearer now she was ahead of it, but the wolf turned its head to face her, and instead of putting on speed as she usually did, Milka re suddenly raised her tail and stiffened her forelegs. Ulyu, 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 shouted Nicholas. The reddish Lubin rushed forward from behind Milka, sprang impetuously at the wolf and seized it by its hindquarters, but immediately jumped aside in terror. The wolf crouched, gnashed her teeth, and again rose and bounded forward, followed at a distance of a couple of feet by all the bourgeois who did not get any closer to her. She'll get away. No, it's impossible, thought Nicholas, still shouting with a hoarse voice. Carré, uli, 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 he shouted, looking round for the old bourgeois, who, who was now his only hope. Carré, with all the strength age had left him, stretched himself to the utmost, and watching the wolf, galloped heavily aside to intercept it. But the quickness of the wolf's lope. I don't think this is a lope at this point. Isn't loping kind of casual? A lope is before a gallop, I guess. Yeah. I thought it more referred to the style rather than the speed. I'm not sure exactly. But the quickness of the wolf's lope and the bourgeois slower pace made it plain that Carrie had miscalculated. Nicholas could already see not far in front of him the wood where the wolf would certainly escape should she reach it. But coming toward him, he saw hounds and a huntsman galloping almost straight at the wolf. There was still hope. A long, yellowish young bozoi, one Nicholas did not know from another leash, rushed impetuously at the wolf from in front and almost knocked her over. But the wolf jumped up more quickly than anyone could have expected and gnashing her teeth flew at the yellowish bozoi which, with a piercing yelp, fell with its head on the ground, bleeding from a gash on its side. Hooray, old fellow, wailed Nic Nicholas. Thanks to the delay caused by this crossing of the wolf's path, the old dog with its felted hair hanging from its thigh was within five paces of it. As if aware of her danger, the wolf turned her eyes on Carré, tucked her tail yet further between her legs and increased her speed. But here, Nicholas only saw that something happened to Carré. The bozoi was suddenly on the wolf, and they rolled together down into a gully just in front of them. That instant, when Nicholas saw the wolf struggling in the gully with the dogs, while from under them could be seen her gray hair and outstretched hind leg, and her frightened, choking head, with her ears laid back, Corey was pinning her by the throat. It was the happiest moment of his life. With his hand on his saddle bow, he was ready to dismount and stab the wolf when she suddenly thrust her head up from among that mass of dogs, and then her four paws were on the edge of the gully. She clicked her teeth. Carré no longer had her by the throat, leaped with a movement of her hind legs out of the gully, and having disengaged herself from the dogs, with tail tucked in again, went forward. Carré, his hair bristling and probably bruised or wounded, climbed with difficulty out of the gully. Oh my God, why? cried Nicholas in despair. Uncle's huntsman was galloping from the other side across the wolf's path, and his bourgeois once more stopped the animal's advance. She was again hemmed in. Nicholas and his attendant, with Uncle and his huntsman, were all riding round the wolf, crying, Uliu, Uliu, shouting and preparing to dismount each moment that the wolf crouched back and started and starting forward again every time she shook herself and moved toward the wood where she would be safe. Already at the beginning of this chase, Daniel, hearing the Uliu, Uliuian, had rushed out from the wood. He saw Carré seize the wolf and checked his horse, supposing the affair to be over. But when he saw that the horseman did not dismount and that the wolf shook herself and ran for safety, Daniel set his chestnut galloping, not at the wolf, but straight toward the wood, just as Carré had run to cut the animal off. As a result of this, he galloped up to the wolf just when she had been stopped a second time by Uncle's bourgeois. Daniel galloped up silently, holding a naked dagger in his left hand and thrashing the laboring sides of his chestnut horse with his whip as if it were a flail. Nicholas neither saw nor heard Daniel until the chestnut, breathing heavily, panted past him, and he heard the fall of a body and saw Daniel lying on the wolf's back among the dogs, 
trying to seize her by the ears. It was evident to the dogs, the hunters, and to the wolf herself that all was now over. The terrified wolf pressed back her ears and tried to rise, but the bourgeois stuck to her. Daniel rose a little, took a step, and with his whole weight, as if lying down to rest, fell on the wolf, seizing her by the ears. Nicholas was about to stab her, but Daniel whispered, don't, we'll gag her, and changing his position, set his foot on the wolf's neck. A stick was thrust between her jaws and she was fastened with a leash as if bridled. Her legs were bound together and Daniel rolled her over once or twice from side to side. With happy, exhausted faces, they laid the old wolf alive on a shying and snorting horse and accompanied by the dogs yelping at her, took her to the place where they were all to meet. The hounds had killed two of the cubs and the bourgeois three. The huntsmen assembled with their booty and their stories and all came to look at the wolf, which, with her broad-browed head hanging down and the bitten stick between her jaws, gazed with great glossy eyes at this crowd of dogs and men surrounding her. When she was touched, she jerked her bound legs and looked wildly, yet simply, at everybody. Old Count Rostov also rode up and touched the wolf. Oh, what a formidable one, said he. A formidable one, eh? He asked Daniel, who was standing near. Yes, your excellency, answered Daniel, quickly doffing his cap. The count remembered the wolf he had let slip in his encounter with Daniel. Ah, but you are a crusty fellow, friend, said the count. For sole reply, Daniel gave him a shy, childlike, meek, and amiable smile. Ugh. You okay? Fuck. What is wrong with people? What were, I'm, what were we supposed to get from that? That's why I'm like, oh right, now we got we got to understand the, the world of the chase. Is it really not for any other reason? Because that was so fucking gratuitous. Do you see something in that? Is it supposed to be symbolic? I mean, Does the wolf represents something. I was like, it must, because why are we doing this? Yeah. But I'm. I think I'm a little like blinded by the by horror to like perceive it. it doesn't seem like a very fair fight. Yeah. No fucking kidding. There's like two hundred of them. Two hundred dogs. Yeah. And people and horses. They're demented. Humans are demented. That's demented. To be like, let's make this as... And it's sport. It's a catch up. It's like, this is bad. This is yes, this you with your 200... This, this is kind of also how I felt whenever I watch, feel whenever I watch any kind of like food documentaries. Mm -hmm. I just am like, the way that we interact with other species is like, I almost think like that, that, that it's not just economics and stuff. Like I think there's something really wrong with this. I think there's something that wants us to be superior, like everything submits to our will and our desires. But how grotesque does that get? Like, there's the like casual superiority of like, yes, let's have a puppy. Mm -hmm. But like some of the shit in, I don't know if it's food ink or what, like, it's like, it's hard, it's horrifying. Yeah. And it doesn't feel like it's necessary. Mm. You've seen those? Yeah. You mean like, it's not just a means like, oh yeah, it has to be this way because that's yeah, the most expedient, I mean, cheapest. Like, it's, it's vindictive and willful. Yeah, there's something like that I think is 
deranged. How about it? Mm -hmm. The argument too that I'm always like, what? What are you guys talking about? <laughs> if you're like, oh yeah, but chickens are dumb or something. What? I'm like, what does that have to do with anything? So is your brother. Yeah, exactly. Like, what? What does that even mean? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, for sure that's the way that we uh, evaluate. That's the way we evaluate species. The less intelligence, the less like. So if it's like not intelligent or if it's not cute. And a less of a nervous system. The less of like a brain and and connected nervous system it has. The more of a like nervous system it is a sophisticated being. Mm -hmm. Which is why people are like, oh, but pigs and dolphins and like, they have all these feelings and they're so intelligent. Yeah, that's why I'm like, pigs, apparently it doesn't matter. Apparently people are fine with us. Because I, I, I don't think the pig argument has really, I mean, definitely it's gone through to some people, but I think a lot of people. I just mean that that's a classic, like, I just think it's an excuse. A reason that people are like, oh, we shouldn't be cruel to them because they're so, like, yeah. pigs are so smart. But that's actually not, I think, a good reason to not be. Bone chillingly. Tastiness too. When people are like, "Oh yeah, but like, it's just so good." Yeah, it is. But to me, that does not explain eighty percent of it, because it doesn't explain the unkind. It doesn't explain like all. That's what I mean by demented. Yeah. There are many ways to kill an animal, yeah. and I don't know that they are all. I mean, I don't think they're all created equal. I don't think terrorizing and like, and horrifying and like hemming in. This all like the way we do with chickens and pigs and stuff like that they can't breathe, that, that everything is like, I don't, I don't think that's the same as like more respectful or like, halfway considerate it's just like don't go out of your way to be horrifying that's what i mean by demented it's like we must be getting something out of this because this is not necessary okay i was about to say something yeah about, what just that it reminds me of the way that the nazis like did all these fucking weird disturbing things mm -hmm. you know what i mean like that just were not necessary for the whatever their stated goal even was like making things yeah do you think evil exists i think evil is a very fraught word and a very, like, so it's difficult to discuss a word that has so much on it that it could be. You know how, like, uh, I there's there's an actual term for this, but, like, humans have this innate desire to self-destruct in a way. To self-destruct? Like, yeah, you know how, um, oh, there's, like, actually a term for this, but, like, part of the reason why people are, like, afraid of heights is because there, there's this uh, compulsion to jump off high buildings. My uh, therapist doesn't agree with that. We really? literally discussed this okay. like maybe one or two, one week ago. Because okay. um, I was sort of saying that that's the reason I'm afraid is because it feels like I'm going to like literally yeah, yeah. Not trusting. Get, get drawn or... Right. Like, it feels like there's something pulling. Yeah. I don't know. And she, but she didn't agree? She believes that, that all of that is fear. That 
I'm afraid that something will be enticing or like drawing, but actually there's not, it's just feel. Hmm. Okay. I don't know. Because I had kind of heard about vertigo that it's like, that you have like a yeah. bit of a compulsion to. Yeah. Like a bit of like a, it's not a chaos principle, but it's just like a, what happens if I do this? Um, and where I was going to go with that was like, yeah, is there something, is there something in human beings that they, they want to do harm and see what happens? I mean, certainly more than much of the animal kingdom because there's a really limited list i think of species that like fuck with their prey yeah there's a like i think by and large 90 percent of species or something don't do that yeah and i don't i don't know the answer to this i don't know if you would at the i don't know if you would do that if it hadn't been done to you, do you think it's related? Like you're putting it outward, what what you've already ingested? I think that definitely happens with people, clearly. But yeah. um, I don't know how to explain it in other species and stuff. Yeah. Like cats. Right, exactly. I don't know what they're doing. Okay. Right. There's something interesting about the cross section between biological imperatives and fun. Yeah. yeah. Because in some ways, like we have all these evolutionary, um, the, the design is for us to enjoy the thing that keeps us alive, mm -hmm. whether it's food or sex or whatever it is like, it, that's a like a biological enticement to do the thing that's going to be best for the species yeah. and for your own survival and stuff. But there's so little of it in generally, I feel like, in the animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. And also, like, enjoying eating is not the same as enjoying killing. Yes. Unless you have to eat. I mean, I have to kill to eat, in which case maybe, I don't know. It's too much. Too much for 9.51 p.m. Truly. Okay. It's been a long day. Let's go to sleep. Let's try to end it like this. Okay, how do you want to end it? <laughs> what? No. So hot. No, I ate them. Thank you. Goodbye.